It has been a strangely tumultuous year for the Green Party. Its internal politics busting out into the open when the membership ousted co-leader James Shaw. He was reinstated unopposed, but since then it's also lost MP Elizabeth Kedikedi in a messy breakup. It is unusual for the party and left us wondering what's been going on. So to discuss it all, James Shaw is here for our election year interview. Good morning. Good morning. Now listen, this time, as we've just said, you know, a year ago, you were ousted. Um, you're, you didn't know it, but you were about to get voted out of the co-leadership. What was that like? Uh, well, it obviously wasn't a career highlight, um, <laughs> I, I have to say. Um, but it also wasn't uh, the most challenging moment I've ever had in my political career. Uh, and I like to think that I'm quite good in a crisis. So ultimately, um, I had to kind of re reflect on, you know, what were the lessons I needed to learn there uh, and then get out and talk to the members. And, um, you know, here I am. James, it looked bruising mm. because you are... Uh doing your best in a high-profile, uh, pressurised and public job, and then you're ambushed by your own party and undermined in this really public way. Mm. Did you did you think, it was it hard to keep going after that, personally? Um, no, I mean, I, well, you, you, you kind of have to go back to, I, what I had to go back to was what am I committed to, right? And, and the reason that I am in politics is because we are facing a multitude of crises, particularly around climate change, biodiversity and inequality. And those are things that I am committed to making a difference on. And so uh, there are moments in which this job is very tough and there are moments which you feel, you know, maybe fair or unfair, you know, uh, and so on, like you don't have the support that you need. But you have to stand in that commitment. And ultimately, um, the choice that I made at that moment was, what am I committed to? I'm, I'm more committed to making a difference in those areas uh, and, and therefore, you know, keep going. What I still don't understand, and I don't know if voters understand, is why that happened. Uh, I think there was a portion, uh, and, and it, you know, it is a minority, but there, there was a, a, a portion of our membership that, you know, are unhappy with my performance um, and didn't feel that I, you know, was living up to the commitments that they felt that I uh, ought to be taking. In what uh, way? Uh, well, I mean, you, you would have to ask them, um, and, and, you know, most of them... You know, it was sort of an anonymous vote, right? So it's it's sort of hard to discern. Yeah. When I travelled around the country after that, and I, you know, it was a real privilege uh, and a bit of a treat to kind of reconnect with people, particularly in some of the more remote branches and out of the way parts of the country, which you know, even in the best of times, let alone in COVID times, uh, hard to get to. Um, and and kind of hearing from them about the sense of urgency with which, you know, they want the government and the Greens in government mm. to be focusing on climate change and so on. I want to talk to you more about that. I want to ask you too, was Elizabeth Kitty Kitty behind that attack? Uh, not to my knowledge. Because that's what, you know, I've heard is that, you know, she was part of the faction that, um, you know, set up that vote against you. And so when the crybaby crisis erupted, that was a way to sort of clean up the parliamentary part of the party. Uh, look, I have absolutely no insight uh, into the extent to which she may or may not have been involved uh, in the events of the last AGM. So I cannot comment on that. Uh, Mardimer and I, as co-leaders of the party, have a duty of care towards our staff and our MPs. We were concerned that the, over the last few years there had been a pattern of behaviour there uh, that when um, the kind of you know, signal chat incident occurred was sort of illustrative of a wider pattern. That's why we initiated the internal process that we did. Do you think that these two combined events have been damaging to the Green Party? That uh, you know, the, the opposition certainly has seized upon them as the Greens being an unstable or an you know, unstable coalition partner, but do you feel that those no. two events have been damaging? No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, so you have to, you know, Marama and I are only the fifth and sixth co-leaders of the Green Party that we have had in the entire 30 year history of the party mm. you know we have more stable leadership than any other political party if you look at our track record over time our polling average now is higher than it was in 2020 it was higher in 2020 than it was in 2017 so we have actually defied the history of support parties in this
this country, we've done something that nobody has ever done before, which is at the end of a parliamentary, at the end of a term in government, have come back stronger. And so I think, you know, actually, if you look at us, our track record is one of stability, despite what every other support party has experienced. Well, I want to talk to you about polling and uh, your vote, because what is going on with that, do you think? I took a deep dive into the Green Party polling over time uh, and its election results, and it tells an interesting story. Mm. The vote has never really recovered from when Materia Tude left the party. It was at around 14% then. Uh, you've been down to 6 You're around 8 now. Why is that? Well, I mean, our, if you look at our polling average over a longer period of time... Well, I'm looking um, at that period, because well, that's when it fell off a cliff and it's never got back. Yeah, I'm, I mean, we were polling sort of around 10, 11, 12, fairly consistent, consistently between 2011 and 2014. Part of, that had did, to, yeah. part of that had to do with the state that the Labour Party was in at the time, and, you know, we were in opposition rather than in government. I think the fact that we have improved our polling over the course of the six years that we've been in government but does defy the history of support parties in government. But it's nowhere near where it was. Well, again, you know, it, it's hard to compare, you know, moments in history when you're in opposition versus when you're in government. In government, we have been more successful than any other support party has ever been in government. But still less successful than when you were in opposition. Well, you, what is success, right? <laughs> success I mean, is 14%. I, you would what, call that success. No, no, no I, I, would, I would say that actually uh, being in government, we are actually able to make a difference is success. Being in opposition, where you aren't able to make as much of a difference as when you're in government. And is, those, those two things seem mutually exclusive. Well, honestly, I mean, at this, at this campaign, we are saying that if you really want to make a difference, on those things. We do need more Green MPs in Parliament and we need more Green Ministers and we need to be sitting around the Cabinet table because obviously it is a numbers game. So I'm, I'm with you on that front. I wonder, you know, the Greens used to be an activist party um, with a proud history of sort of activism. I'm thinking Sue Kedgley and the sour crates and those kinds of things. But you wanted to stamp that out. You wanted to take it in a more sort of mainstream direction, get away from the images of Green MPs dancing around the Maypole. I think that was one of the things you said when you came in. But have you gone too far? If you look at the results that we've managed to achieve in government uh, and the fact that our polling now has risen on average since we got into government in 2017... But that, that was a low ebb for you in 2017. Well, well, getting into government was the first time we'd ever been in government with ministers, right? So to me, that is an absolute highlight, and I'm very proud of that. And, if, and, and the fact that we have built our support during that period of time, I think, demonstrates that we've been able to say, in government, we're able to deliver as part of a, uh, as part of a, a, a coalition government government. If you want more of that, people are saying, well, we need more Green MPs, right? And that's that's why our, our, our support is building over the time that we've been in government. I want to talk to you about some of your environmental policy and your work in government, particularly as Climate Minister. You have had some wins in that portfolio, mm. but it can't be going fast enough for you. Are you sort of at the mercy of Labour's appetite for change in this space? Well, ultimately, uh, you know, I, I am very proud of the work that we've been able to do, and including in this term when Labour has not needed our votes. So we, you know, that that is means that everything that we do, we do as a result of the quality of our relationship, rather than because we've got you know political leverage uh, through through the numbers uh, in in Parliament. But we have during the course of this term of Parliament, you know, we've got the first ever emissions reduction plan. Three fifths of the cabinet now have named responsibilities under a statutory document for climate change. That's a massive shift. Mm. You've had things like you know, the New Zealand steel uh, arrangement, which is gonna take 800,000 tonnes of CO2 out of the atmosphere every single year. Uh, huge success with the clean car discount, massive uptake of electric vehicles, all of that kind of uh, stuff. So yeah. it, it, I think we've made a lot of progress. But, you're right, <laughs> we should be going further and we should be going faster and that's why I'm arguing for more Green MPs at this campaign. Does all of that work um, hang in the balance now? Because the second emissions reduction plan mm. is set to uh, next year to bring in aviation and shipping. And, crucially, um, it's when agricultural pricing begins. If National gets in, oh, that's in 2025, but if National gets in, it's already said it's going to kick that down mm -hmm. uh, the road for five years. And um, so it seems like this is a crucial moment and everything that you've been working for hangs in the balance. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And that, that's why this election is so important. I mean, the set of decisions that the next government has to make are crucially important and they will influence the direction and the momentum of climate policy in this country for the next 15 years mm. out to the year 2040. Uh, so it's, it's a very, very important time. But, but everything could be undone. 
it could be stalled, it could be delayed by this change of government. That's got to be scary. Well, that is why we are arguing at this election to have more Green MPs in Parliament and more Green Ministers sitting around the Cabinet table. Um, you are releasing some new policy this weekend. It is going to be on housing. Um, what we know so far is development bonuses. Yes. Um, tell us about those. They'll allow more stories to be added when buildings are universal design and, and yes. have environmental features? Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the, I, can I just, before I get into the specifics of that, the context is really important because I think we've ended up with this really two-dimensional debate, a uh, one-dimensional debate, where on the one hand you're saying, well, let's do density badly, and on the other hand, you know, maybe let's cover up all of our farmland with urban sprawl. Mm -hmm. And actually we'd like to bring a more three-dimensional approach to that, which is to say, well, why don't we do density well in the places where people live already? So the development bonuses are a way of saying to developers, look, uh, you can get, an, for example, an additional story on your building if you build that to a home star 7 rating quality, which is really good in terms of energy efficiency, warmth, dryness, and so on, mm. and also accessibility design for you know people with disabilities and so on. So they'll be able to go up an extra third. How will that work with councils, for example, who will have their own criteria? Around well, it's an, it's an overlay on those criteria. So it, it essentially says, for example, if you're in an area which has got a three, st it's zoned for three stories, you'll be able to go up to a fourth story, but you won't be able to go up any further than that. So you're saying we would add a third on, but it on on top of what's already zoned for. Right. Um, and there's more to come, much more to come on this tomorrow. That's right. So we will stay tuned. Um, I want to circle back to sort of where we began this interview a little bit, which is about your future personally. How much longer do you see yourself, you know, in the job? And, you know, this is not a sort of loaded question. I'm just wondering sure. where your finish line, where you see your finish line. Well, when, when I first ran for the Green Party co-leadership in 2015, I said that my commitment was to take us into government for the first time and then safely out the other side. So it's open-ended uh, in the sense that... Um, we are not yet done, you know. In fact, I would argue that we're only, uh, you know, really just getting going. There's so much more that we need to do. But you could be safely coming out the other side if you don't, if, the, if Labor and the Greens can't get there in, no, in October. Well, I'm not counting on that, you know. I'm putting all of my efforts and all of my energy and all of my attention into making sure that we do secure a historic third term in government. Grant Robertson stood aside this year in Wellington Central. That is a seat that you have contested mm. before. It is wide open now that Grant's gone, but you didn't go for that, which also tells me that perhaps, you know, it's not a long future, you know. That would be the wrong inference to take. <laughs> so, I'm look, I, I wanted to say, if, if I was going to be the MP for Wellington Central, and I think, uh, you know, we've got a very good chance of winning that seat, and Tamitha Paul is an outstanding woman, sure. and I think will do a great job, but I would want to give that job 100% of my attention. I also want to give 100% of my attention to my job as climate change minister, and I did not feel that I could do both of those full justice. So the people of Wellington Central can get a two-for-one deal here. Right? <laughs> now you're going to sell it. You're gonna, you're yeah, well, look, I mean, you, you have in Tamitha, I, I think, that. a remarkable woman who's doing a terrific job in council and would be an amazing advocate for Wellington Central in Parliament. And... You get you. You get me, yeah, that's yeah, right. There you go. But I just want to circle back for a second. You know, if, if you can't get there at the end at, in this election, will that be it for you? Look, I'm not contemplating that outcome. I'll deal with that. Uh, you know, if we get to that, at the moment, I'm just, you know, 100% of my attention is on ensuring that we get more Green MPs and more Ministers sitting around the next Cabinet. All right, well, you have got three and a half months to get there. James Shaw, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. On the Nation.